Now, cast an eye over the phrase, but as soon as it has elements all around them, Allah takes away their light, and see how its words light up the darkness of their bewilderment, which is their main aim. You heard in the fourth matter above that the power of speech lies in the mutual response of its parts. The but hints at the immediate onset of absolute despair after being full of hope. As soon as comprises a proportionate conditional syllogism which, by demonstrating the certainty of the first proposition, infers the certainty and realization of the subsequent one, that is, their being overwhelmed by darkness and losing their source of consolation. It has illumined, indicates that they kindled the fire for light, not for warmth. And this hints at their terrible dismay, for its illumination only served to see the perils besetting them and to learn of their existence. Had it not been for the light, they could have deceived themselves and felt reassured. While all around them indicates that they were encompassed by terror on all four sides and that they had to preserve themselves with the light from the harms beleaguering them from all six directions. As for takes away, it is the consequence of the condition and therefore necessitated by the first part of the conditional sentence, it has elements, but as discussed above, this necessity is not clear, it is hidden and implies the sentences, they did not attend to and maintain the fire and did not know its value as a bondage and the light made them get above themselves and their glee and cockiness made them forget to tend it, so Allah took it from them. The ascription of takes away to Allah indicates the frustration of two herbs hope of rectifying their situation and hope of divine mercy. For it infers that the heaven levitation does not allow their situation to be put to rights and suggests that it is the punishment for human faults. This is the reason Allah the Most High chastises them. Thus, what they were cleaving to was turned away from them when the causes were suspended and this was the hope of mercy. For help cannot be sought from the truth in order to notify it. The preposition be of be nurihim, their light, signifies their despairing of the light returning, for what Allah has taken cannot be sought. For there is a clear difference between dhahaba bi, which means he laid claim to it and took it, and adhabahu, which means he removed it or took it away, while Dhahaba means he went on his way. In the latter two, there is the possibility of return, but in the former, there is none. In light is a slight hint about the dissembler's situation on the bridge of Sirat. The possessive pronominal suffix, there, which denotes particularity, infers their terrible grief. For a person suffers greater sorrow if his fire goes out while other people's fires are burning brightly. See how the very subtlest pearls of eloquence are Allah's in the Quran. Do you not see how all the parts of the sentence are turned towards the general aim? I mean the dissembler's alarm and despair is like a pool at the confluence of rivers. Now consider carefully and leaves them in utter darkness wherein they cannot see. The conjunction and indicates that they combine two losses, they are stripped of the light and clothed in darkness. The use of left abundant instead of he made stay or something similar suggests that they have become like lifeless corpses and kernelless shells. It is fitting therefore that they should be abandoned as worthless and discarded. The in infers that in their view everything has ceased to exist and that nothing remains but the darkness which seems to be non-existence and encases them like the grave. The plural of darknesses indicates that the blackness of the night 
and tenebrous clothes have given rise to the darkness of despair and fear in their spirits, and that where they are found is filled with the darkness of desolation and despondency. For them, time too is filled with the darkness of silence and motionlessness. It suggests that they are entirely swathed in multifarious darknesses. The use of the indefinite signifies that the darkness is unknown to them, their never before having experienced it, and this increases its impact on them. As for they cannot see, it states clearly the worst calamities. For the person who cannot see suffers more tribulations, and because he lacks sight, he experiences to a greater degree the slightest misfortunes. The imperfect tense is used to depict their condition in the eye of the imagination, so the listener actually sees their consternation and his conscience is affected. The verb is without object to generalize the meaning, they cannot see anything that would be of use to them and might protect them, and they cannot see the dangers that they might avoid them, and they cannot see their companions to avail themselves of their intimacy. It is as though each is on his own and alone. Next, consider the phrases deaf, dumb, blind, and they cannot turn back, and listen to how they confide in one another, for these four phrases are a definition shared by both the parable or comparison and the thing portrayed. They are intermediate between them and are turned to both. They tell off both sides' conditions and are a mirror to both showing you their characters. They result from both and tell you their stories. The aspect looking to the comparison, know that a person who is struck by such a calamity clings onto the hope of being saved by listening closely for the voice of someone who might save him, but the night is so silent and soundless it defends him. Still, he hopes to make someone hear, but the deafness of the night makes him dumb. Then he hopes to be guided by the sight of a fire or light, but the unseen night makes him blind. Then he hopes to return to the start of his journey, but the door is blocked up against him like someone who falls into a bog and the more he struggles, the more he sinks into it. The aspect looking to those depicted in the comparison. Know that when they get caught up in the darkness of disbelief and dissembling, they could be saved from it in four successive ways. Firstly, they could raise their heads to listen to the truth and heed the Quran's guidance, but when the rush of desire prevents the sounds of the Qur'an entering their ears, and their frenzy takes them by the ears and holds them back from this path, the Qur'an reproaches them with the epithet Div. This indicates that this door is blocked up and suggests that their ears have been cut off. Secondly, they should lower their heads and consult their consciences and ask about the truth and the path. But when abstinence seizes their tongues and hatred tucks them back into the hollow of their mouths, the Quran deals a blow at them with the word dumb. This indicates that that door too is shut in their faces and alludes to their failing to endorse the truth. Thirdly, they should make the effort to extract lessons from the evidences in the world around them, but heedlessness places its hands over their eyes, and faint blindness draws down their eyelids, so the Quran calls them blind, a sign that they have strayed from this path too. The omission of the particle K indicates that their eyes, the lights of the head, have as though been plucked out. Fourthly, they should recognize the ignominy of their situation and feel disgusted and regret it and repent and return, but because, due to the corruption of their natures caused by their insisting on their way and the dominance of lust and a Satan, their souls make these abominations seem appealing to them. So the Quran says, 
and they cannot turn back. This is a sign that the final paths have been closed up for them and indicates that although they have got into this situation voluntarily, they do not have the will to extricate themselves and are floundering like a man caught in quick sense. Verses 19-20 Ev kasayyibim mine semai fihi zulmatun ve ra'dun ve bergu Yec'alûne eshâbi'ehum fî edânihim mine sevâ'ig hâzer el mevt Vallâhu muhîtun bil kâfirîn Yekâdul bergu yekhtefu ebsârihum Kullemâ edâ'e lehum meşev fîhi ve izâ ezleme aleyhim gâmû وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَذَهَبَ بِسَمْعِهِمْ وَأَبْصَارِهِمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ Or the parable of a violent cloud burst in the sky with utter darkness, thunder and lightning. They put their fingers into their ears to keep out the pearls of thunder in terror of death. But Allah encompasses with His might all who deny the truth. The lightning well nigh takes away their sight. Whenever it gives them light, they advance therein, and whenever darkness falls around them, they stand still. And if Allah so willed, He could indeed take away their hearing and sight, for verily Allah is powerful over all things. The noteworthy points in these verses may also be subsumed under three headings. Their positioning in regard to the preceding verses, the positioning of the verses, phrases, and the relationships between them, and the relationships between the constants of the phrases. These resemble the relationships between the hour, minute, and second hands of a clock. That aspect of the composition that looks to the positioning of these verses and those that preceded it. The Qur'an repeats the parables thus extending its descriptions and indicating the need to describe at length the dissemblers in their alarm and confusion which are of two sorts as is shown in the following summaries. A summary of the first parable. The dissembler sees himself in the desert of existence apart from his fellows, ostracized from the assembly of beings and outside the jurisdiction of the true son. In his view, everything is non-existent, all creatures are alien, silent and motionless, they are forlorn and doomed to extinction. Can this compare with the believer who through the light of belief looks on beings as friendly and is familiar with the whole universe? A summary of the second parable. The dissembler supposes that in its entirety the world is announcing his death with its calamities and menacing him with its disasters, and screaming at him with its events, and raining down blows on him from all sides, as though all its beings have united in enmity to him, and everything beneficial has become harmful. The only reason for this, however, is his having no support and no source of help, as has been discussed. Can this compare with the believer? who, by virtue of his belief, hears the glorifications of all beings and their joyous utterances. Moreover, the fact there is a second parable indicates that the dissemblers are divided into a common law class, conformable with the first parable, and an arrogant or winning class corresponding to the second. The relationship of this latter parable with the context in respect of the listener the first people the Qur'an was addressing were the desert dwellers whose bed was the floor of the desert and roof the tent of the heavens. They had all experienced these things or heard about them from their fellows and were therefore familiar with them and found them as effective as proverbs. The relationship of the second parable with the first one is abundantly clear for it completes and perfects it and in many instances even makes the same points. The relationship between the parable and those depicted by it, the dissemblers, has six aspects. The first, they are both totally overcome by bewilderment when all ways of escape are blocked up 
and all means of deliverance are suspended. The second, they are both overwhelmed by terrible fear and they all imagine that beings are united in hostility to them and that they cannot live in safety even for a minute. The third, they are both struck by alarm so fearsome they become insane and lose their minds. It is like someone who sees a flashing sword and tries to defend himself by closing his eyes or hears the roar of guns and tries to avoid being hit by stopping up his ears or like someone who does not want the sun to set and impedes the workings of his watch so that the wheel of fate will cease to turn. How crazy they are! For the thunderbolts will not turn back when they stop up their ears, nor will the fiery lightning pity them when they close their eyes. From this it is understood that they have nothing left to cling on to. The fourth, the sun and rain and light and water are apparently the source of the life of flowers and plants and for the raising of them, but they also cause dead things to putrefy and filthy things to rot. Similarly, if mercy and bounty do not encounter places that are ready and prepared for them and know their value, they are transformed into trouble and revenge. The fifth, just as if one disregards the words, there is a correspondence between the meanings of the second parable and of the story of the dissemblers it portrays, which form the basis of the parabolic metaphor, so too there are relationships between the parts of both of these. For a cloud burst is the life of plants, as Islam is the life of spirits. The thunder and lightning indicate promise and threat, while the darknesses show you the doubts of disbelief and skepticism of dissembling. The positioning and relationships between the verses phrases. With the phrase, a violent cloud burst in the sky, the Quran infers that the dissemblers resemble people forced to travel through a wild desert on a dark night in a violent rainstorm, the calamities rain pelting down on them like bullets from the brimming sky. In this way, it is alerting the listener's mind for he is waiting for an explanation of why the rain clouds, which are essentially much desired mercy, are such a ghastly calamity. So to illustrate their awesomeness, it says, with utter darknesses, suggesting that the rain contains the clouds darkness and denseness. Similarly, because of its abundance and being so widespread and general, it is as though with its black droplets the rain contains the fragmenting night. As soon as the listener hears with utter darkness, he expects an explanation as though the speaker hears the sound of thunder in his brain so says, and thunder. This suggests its menacing threats for the skies, the commander of beings, are intent on wiping out the dissemblers and they rumble and roar at them with their thunder. In the face of this, the terrified calamity stricken dissemblers imagine that the universe, whose beings cooperate and assist each other, is bent on harming them despite its tranquility and despite its silence is howling at them horribly. When they hear the thunder, they imagine it is uttering threats at them for out of fear they think it is roaring at them. Then, as soon as the listener hears the thunder, its constant companion strikes his mind, and for this reason the Quran says, and lightning, which indicates through the use of the indefinite that it is strange and wondrous. Yes, it is indeed wondrous. For when it is burned, a world of darkness dies and is wrapped up and cast into nothingness. But on its death, another world of darkness is resurrected and raised to life. It is as though it is fire that when extinguished leaves as its legacy a world full of smoke. The person struck by it, therefore, should examine it attentively and not glance at it superficially due to familiarity, for in this way he may discover the subtle art of divine power. 
Having heard these descriptions, the listener is moved to ask, what did they do? Did they attempt anything? So the Quran says, they put their fingers into their ears to keep out the pearls of thunder in terror of death, indicating that the dissemblers have no refuge and no place of recourse and are like the roaring men who clutch at what cannot be clutched at. In their terror, they use their fingers instead of just the fingertips, as though their alarm is beating them on the hands, so they stuff their hands in their ears out of pain, and in their stupidity, they block up their ears, so the thunderbolts do not strike them. Following this, the listener's mind continues to investigate, and he asks, is this calamity general, or is it particular? that escape is still hoped for? And the Quran replies, But Allah encompasses with his might all who deny the truth, inferring that the disaster is a penalty for their ingratitude for bounties. Allah, the Most High, punishes them through it for their remaining exceptions to the divine laws deposited in general run of beings. When the listener hears the violent purse of thunder, he asks himself, won't the lightning be useful for them by lighting up their way? So the Quran says, the lightning well nigh takes away their sight, indicating that just as the thunder is inimical to them and they are unable to hear, so the lightning is hostile towards them with its lights blinding their eyes. Then, hearing that the universe is united in its hostility towards them, the listener's mind calls out, what will happen to them? What can they do? What are they trying to do? So the Quran says, whenever it gives them light, they advance therein, and whenever darkness falls around them, they stand still, indicating that they are confused, hastened, and bewildered, watching for the slightest opportunity and the smallest glimpse of the road. Whenever it appears to them, they move forward, but with their anguished spirits, jerkily like decapitated hands, and then become frozen to the spot. So, by way of inquiry, the listener's mind asks, why don't they die, or become completely blind and deaf, and be saved from their anguish? And the Quran says, and if Allah so willed, he could indeed take away their hearing and sight. That is, they do not deserve to be delivered from their plight. For this reason, divine will does not cause them to die. If it were to act, it would take away their hearing and sight. It is more fitting for those who are recalcitrant and deviate from the laws of the Most High that they retain their ears to hear their punishment and their sight to see it. Containing all these points, from beneath its exterior, the story hints at divine sublimity and power and the disposals of the Most High in the universe, especially the marvels of the thunder, lightning, and clouds. On recalling this, with his conscience arose the listener declares, Glory be to him! How great the power of the one whose awesomeness the universe manifests! and whose wrath these calamities display. So the Quran said, Verily, Allah is powerful over all things. Now for the relationships between the constraints of the phrases. Know that the or, of, or the parable of a violent rainstorm indicates that the dissemblers represented in the comparison are divided into two sorts and is a sign that there is a true correspondence both between the two parables and between them and the condition of the dissemblers and that there is an indisputable similarity between them. Moreover, the OR comprises the intensifying conjunction bel al tarqiyya meaning but rather no on the contrary but indeed for the second parable is more terrifying. The lack of correspondence between OR the parable of a violent rainstorm and the dissemblers, that is, the dissimilarity between them, because the dissemblers are being likened to the rainstorm 
necessitates that the rain does resemble is implied. This implied thing is not stated for conciseness and the words are made concise, that is, the purpose of the ellipsis is to make the meaning prolix and the prolix meaning is referred to the listener's imagination so he may seek further meanings from the context. Thus, by reason of this lack of correspondence, the Quran is as though saying, or they resemble people who journey through the empty desert and dark night and are struck by many calamities resulting from a violent rainstorm. The replacements of the familiar friendly word rain with rain clouds downpour infers that the droplets of the rain are each calamities pelting down on them like bullets finding their mark and that the dissemblers have nowhere to shatter. The explicit mention of in the sky stating specifically that the rain comes from the sky alone is to express generality. That is, the sky is specified to make it absolute as in the verse, there is not an animal that lives on the earth nor a being that flies on its wings. That is, the rain has taken possession of the whole face of the sky. Some Quranic commentators concluded from from the sky here and from the verse and he sends down from the sky mountain masses of clouds wherein is hail that the rain falls from the body of the sky and some of them even imagined the existence of an ocean beneath the sky but the science of rhetoric does not endorse this no the meaning is from the direction of the sky and the sky is specified for the above mentioned reason Moreover, since the word sky is used generally for everything above you, the clouds and atmosphere may also be said to be the sky. Verification of the subject If you consider divine power, you will see that all sides are equal before it, that is, the rain may fall from any direction. And if you consider divine wisdom, you will see that it establishes the optimum order in things necessitating the preservation of the general balance and that it chooses the most direct means. As for the rain, it is formed through the condensation of the water, vapor dispersed through the globe of the atmosphere, one of the ten constraints of which is this vapor in its depths. An elucidation of this. When divine will commands the water molecules, they comply and steal away from all around. They join forces and become rain-laden clouds. Then, on the orders of their commander, they condense and become raindrops. The angels, who are the representatives of the laws in force in the universe and reflect its order, take them by the hand so they do not crawl together in masses and strike each other and they take them down to the ground. In order to preserve the balance of the atmosphere, the seas and earth vaporize to replace what has been lost through distillation. The reason some people imagined the existence of a heavenly ocean was their conceiving of figures of speech as facts. For to portray the green of the atmosphere as the color of the sea and the atmosphere as containing more water than the Pacific Ocean is a figure of speech not distant from the reality.